My name is Stuart Max, and I'm here representing the Mini Builders research team. My name is Dr. Aubrey de Grey, and I'm the Chief Science Officer of a biomedical research charity based in California named Sense Research Foundation. My name is Sanford Dickert, and I am a CTO, VP of Engineering, slash creative technologist. So I'm Dr. Chris Brower. I'm the Director of Innovation at Goldsmiths, University of London. My name is Suen Sia, and I'm a researcher at the University of Bristol. And my research interest is into haptic technologies, so how you can create a sense of touch with an interface. So my name is Sabine Howard. I'm a lecturer in engineering mathematics at the University of Bristol and at the Bristol Robotics Lab. I think swarm robotics is really an up-and-coming field. So if, if, if you look at it nowadays, we really are starting to have the technology and the algorithms uh, to start to make these, these swarm systems a reality. And I'm thinking of the nanoscale, I'm thinking of you know, swarms of robots on the ground, swarms of robots in the air. I kind of worked on the, at the different scales. Um, and, and I think once we start to understand how to put these pieces together, we're really going to see interesting real-world applications, which build on the fact that we can have so many entities working together. So, so in terms of medical applications, the way you think of a swarm is that, let's say you're trying to deliver something to a tumor, right? So they're going to, you're injecting them in the bloodstream, they go through the bloodstream, and then they leak out into the tumor environment. And when they leak out, you have lots of them working together. And so the way to visualize it, and this is what you would hope to see, but it is still a lot of work to get there, is to see really these swarms of, of nanoparticles or smart drugs that are able to distribute throughout the tumor environments. And so just like you would look at robots over a map, uh, you would have that but at a very small scale so that they would go where they need to go uh, to be more efficient or you know concentrate where they need to concentrate to be bright enough uh, to serve as biomedical um, sensors uh, from the outside. So that's sort of the small scale. If you look at the bigger scale, uh, we're already starting to see there's companies like, uh, like Kiva Systems, which does warehouse robots, and they're already deploying thousand, uh, over a thousand robots in certain warehouses that are able to, to in a distributed manner, plan you know, where the shelves should go, bring the shelves to the right place. So these are really, really situations where you need a lot of, a lot of entities to work together to actually have an impact in real world applications. I think we are now at the point where, possibly not in five years, but I'd say quite possibly, and certainly in 10 years, stem cell therapies will become a really big part of medicine and will give us the ability to eliminate or very greatly ameliorate diseases that are still very problematic today. Stem cell therapy is a very versatile paradigm indeed. It's something that can be used in all, ma in all manner of different ways. In aging and the diseases of old age, perhaps the single most conspicuous example is Parkinson's disease, which is quite a simple disease by the standards of most aspects of aging. It's entirely caused by the loss of cells in one particular part of the brain, the substantia nigra, which just is prone to have cells dying much more rapidly than other parts of the brain do because of aspects of what, the, what those particular cells do. And stem cell therapies for Parkinson's disease are now in clinical trials. They were tried first 20 years ago and they didn't work, well they worked very patchily, but when they did work they worked spectacularly. And the reason they were only patchily successful was because we didn't know enough back then about how to manipulate stem cells into exactly the right state. We're much better at that now and that's why people are so optimistic about the new second generation of clinical trials that are, on, that are ongoing right now. I really think in the next five years, our technology is going to be something you're going to see on building sites. Slow, slowly but surely, this is going to be a, a part of, of everyday construction. But I have to admit, while we were doing the project, we were really inspired by the work of Tesla. And we, we, we are big fans of, of what's going to happen there. And I really see the way they, they the design Tesla's power really comes from the design and they, they just make superior products and they make something that maybe we thought five, ten years ago was a pipe dream. They've managed to actually make this a reality and I think they get people to believe that these things are a reality and this product is a, is a proof that we can do things differently and, and better and still make a really good profit as well. for me would be um, thin and flexible and also transparent displays. So the idea is that um, at some point, you know, the, 
technology or screens are going to be ubiquitous. They're going to be everywhere, um, on your coffee table, um, on your plate maybe, on a piece of fork. Uh, and the only way to achieve that really is with this uh, transparent displays so that you, you can get information everywhere. I think, was it Samsung probably? They had a mirror um, display that, you know, when you were brushing your teeth, told you the weather, um, what time it is and things like that. So just things like that you want to know. You don't have to, you know, go and look for your watch or go and look at the clock at the same time. My per current enthusiasm corresponds to telepresence robotics or remote presence systems. So we know that right now we're all worried about climate change. The fact that we are a global society, the greatest challenge is actually creating these ties that bond us together more effectively. And yes, television, internet provides this capability in some fashion, but being able to be in a different location with someone in as much a human fashion as can be, I find that Skype, video conferencing is not enough because there is this missing aspect that we crave. So in the concept of telepresence robotics, what we're discovering is that the small nuances of nonverbal movement, the ability to sense more than just what the screen shows, but seeing other people's movements, how they're holding their shoulders, how they react, as these devices and solutions enhance, you're going to find that you're able to communicate a lot more expressively it won't be that you'll have arms possibly, but you might be able to turn your head. Then you might turn your eyes and do something that actually shows your expressions, your micro expressions, that creates a greater understanding. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the possibilities that virtual assistants would have to enhance people's lives. Uh, we've done a lot of research around wearable technologies, really in-depth research. Uh, more powerfully than in any other technology that we've researched in 20 years of looking at emerging tech, people indicate psychologically that they feel like wearable technologies enhance their lives, boost their personal abilities, make them more confident, make them more aware about themselves, even more attractive. Um, you know, this is, this is a psychological effect in many cases because we know that the, the reality of what the technology is actually doing onto itself doesn't necessarily have that impact. But it's what the, the individual that feels like they suddenly have transparency about themselves and that they know more about themselves. And I think people have been struggling for a long time to, you know, simple things like, under what conditions am I happiest? Under what conditions am I most productive? These are questions that hardly anyone can answer, you know. And if we knew the answers to them, we would probably make lifestyle changes and we would do things that would have a real impact on our everyday lives just because we recognize those kind of connections in the same way as if you don't eat until just shortly after, after lunch and that makes you grumpy, then you need to be aware of that. There's many, many, many other things in our lives that are all interconnected like that. The thing that really is going to have a huge, or is currently having a huge impact on society and as well as, as the West also, is the drones that we, we see.